Warning, this video is a spoiler for The Handmaid's Tale, okay? So if you haven't seen it, I basically describe a lot of things that happen in the show. And welcome back to my channel. If you are new here, my name is Amanda Ray. If you don't know my story, I will leave a link down below in the description box. But to give you a up-to-date on who I am, I left a polygamous cult when I was 17, almost 18 years old. My dad had three wives. The first wife was my mom's full sister and the third wife was my dad's half-sister. I have over 30 siblings from my dad. The leader of my polygamous cult has 27 wives and over 300 kids, it's believed. I escaped at 17, almost 18 years old, and I was actually contacted by producers the first year of being out, and I was on Escaping Polygamy for four years. So if you see my face and it's familiar, it's probably from that. I have since continued on my YouTube to speaking out against this type of stuff because the cult is still existing. This type of abuse is still happening, and I'm, I'm noticing the more I talk about it, the more I realize this type of abuse doesn't just happen in these polygamous groups it happens all around us so how do we get this stuff to stop happening well I'll tell you one thing it's not by not talking about it so I'm gonna talk about it when I first left the cult that I came from I was introduced to the it was probably like a few years after I left actually I was introduced to this show called a handmaid's tale and it was introduced it, it was recommended by a bunch of people who had left cults and they said, Amanda, you gotta watch this. I sat down to watch the first episode and I was shaking by like halfway through the episode. I was shaking and I was like, I was convinced that the writer of The Handmaid's Tale had either been in the order or researched all of these cults because it was exactly the feelings that I felt when I was there. It was the Bible verses that they used in the cult. But again, I think I'm just learning that the, the world, it's sad, like that we have this pattern in history of women being treated like this. I'm gonna kind of dissect how, how much of The Handmaid's Tale is so similar to the order and the cult that I grew up in. I went through the first, let's see, the first like th almost to the third season. And I'm gonna just be dissecting how much of it is like correlates with the cult that I came from. Side note, this is probably the last time you guys are gonna see me with blonde hair. Take a good look, because it's not gonna be like this anymore. Let's start off, if you look at the order and the FLDS, there's obviously a huge difference between what they're wearing, right? Like the FLDS, they have to make all of their own clothes. They have restrictions on, like they're not supposed to be showing their arms. They have even undergarments that they're supposed to be wearing underneath them. Uh, in the order, it was a lot different, but it was also kind of like The Handmaid's Tale. So The Handmaid's Tale, you see like the red dress and the white bonnet is what the handmaids wear. That's how you tell they're a handmaid. And then the Marthas wear like this brown outfit. And then like, you know, there, there's like different categories for each status. And I feel like that correlates a little bit to the order, whereas you would see a woman, a young woman who is still living with her parents, they're supposed to abide by the modesty rules of the parents. And a lot of times you would see when someone would get married, when a girl would get married, she would start to dress more provocative because now she doesn't ask to, she doesn't have to ask her parents what she's allowed to wear. She can now ask her husband. So a lot of times you would see them dressing more provocative for their husband or fi or it was mostly just because they didn't get to wear these things. So now they're finally getting to get it out of their system. It's kind of like that, like the lower, the lower status, and then you get up. I don't even know if you would say lower, or higher status. It's really just going from one household and being given to the next household, and then you, there's rules that abide by both of those things. Hi, I know it's weird. It's different. This is future Amanda. I'm popping in because you'll see me here and there in the video popping in because there's a few things that I forgot to mention. One story I did want to tell because. There are going to be some order people being like, hey, that's not true about the dress code thing, whatever. Like, I wore this before and after I got married, blah, blah, blah. I'm saying from what I saw in my own experience, and there's probably some families that were different. When I was a teenager and I wasn't married, my parents went through my closet and took out everything in my closet that they thought was inappropriate and they didn't want me to wear anything that was 
inappropriate. So after I found out that they went through my closet and they just raided the whole entire closet, I asked why they did that and they said that they're going to save my bad bad outfits, my inappropriate outfits, and then they're going to ask my husband when I get married one day if I can have those outfits back. Fast forward, you guys know I get married when I'm 18 years old, but I left the cult. I get married on escaping polygamy, and my mom actually kept the box, and she had the, and she, it was weird because she was going through this phase of like wanting me back in her life, but like she couldn't because I was bad because I left the cult. So like, she met with me and my husband, and she had that box of clothes, and I remember thinking she was gonna give me the box of clothes, but she gave it to my husband, and said. You can decide if Amanda gets to wear these. Something I wanted to mention that happens in the very first seven minutes of the very first episode of The Handmaid's Tale, she meets, so the handmaid, Offred, meets Mr. Waterford. And the encounter is very, like, respectful, and she's like, you know, there's, there's, you could tell that there's these lines of respect for the man versus the woman. And that is something that is in the order, too. So I, I wrote some notes on this. So we were told in the order that you give the best seat to the husband. You give the best seat to the man of the house. And the man of the house is like God. You worship them. They are the, they are the one that is going to bring you to heaven. And a lot of the times I would hear women saying, well, if I sin, it's not as bad, but as long as he doesn't sin because he's the one that even has my salvation in his hands. It, they literally act like they don't have control over their own salvation. The man is the one that's going to get them to heaven. I even heard my own mother saying things like, oh, if she swears that's, that's bad, she shouldn't be doing it. But if my dad sw swears, he is jeopardizing all of our place in heaven because that is how we're getting into heaven is through the man. It's like, first of all, so the women have no power over where they end up in heaven, so they better pray that they marry a righteous man. I even remember when Cammie was married in the group. Because the men have such a great responsibility to bring their family to heaven, that's why we are there to cater to them, right? We're supposed to give them the best chair in the house and give them the best blah blah blah. And I remember Cammie when she was married, we were having, I think it was like a New Year's dinner or something, and Cammie poured a, like made a plate of food for herself and went and sat down. And my mom started scolding her and was like, how dare you make a plate for you before your husband? You need to make a plate for your husband. You need to show him like where his, his place is in your life and in your heart. Which is so crazy to me because if you treat someone like that, like here, let me give you a plate of food. Here, let me give you the best seat. Let me, you're worshiping them. Are they gonna stay humble? Are they gonna, no, they're gonna be like, where's my seat? Where's, you know what I'm saying? So if they're this righteous person, I think we should be spitting on them really, in my opinion, but whatever. Did Jesus, okay, we're gonna bring Jesus into this. Jesus didn't get the best, like he wasn't sitting on a throne and a go, whatever, I'm getting, I'm already getting heated. We're not even close to halfway done. Speaking of status, okay, there's a scene where Alfred is leaving her house to go to the grocery store. She runs into Nick and he's like shoveling some stuff because he's like, whatever. She starts explaining how he's a lower level man. Into the garage, low status, hasn't even been issued a woman. No trouble. So it's like the higher status men get awarded wives and the lower status men don't get wives. Isn't that interesting? How ironic, that's exactly like the order. And it's not even like, because you could be busting your ass in the order. You could be literally work, be the hardest working man in the order, but if your bloodline isn't the bloodline that they want, if it's not the Kingston, if you're not closely related to Paul himself, sucks to be you. You're gonna be single forever. They don't ever explain, and maybe someone can answer this if you're really into The Handmaid's Tale, they don't ever explain how someone moves up in the status, like in the totem pole, you know what I'm saying? She starts walking to the grocery store, right? And she has, this friend, which is not really a friend, and this is something so similar in the order. I, I wish I'd talked to someone from the FLDS to see if this was true in, in the FLDS culture, but in the order, it was like, we had friends, yes, but all the time we were wondering which ones were tattling on us, which ones were turning us in and getting us in trouble. So we were always so careful about who we told about, like, what, if we wanted to leave or if not, because they believed in the order that 
kind of like the LeBaron group that believes in the blood atonement, like kill them before they sin so that they don't go to hell, so that you can kill them before they sin so they go to heaven and not hell. In the order, it was more of, I love my friends so much that I'm going to tell on them so that they stop sinning so that they can go to heaven with me. So you, you would catch yourself in these deep friendships and like you would be telling them everything because you want to be friends and you want to bond with them and you want to have this emotional connection with someone and then the next day your dad is in the living room like do you want to tell me what you did last night and you know you shouldn't have told your friend but then your friend's crying to you the next day saying Amanda I wanted to save you from going to hell so it's like everywhere you go, you're scared to even make a friend because you're scared that they're going to try to save you from yourself. <laughs> There's three types of people in the order. One, so if you're trying to like trust someone, right? There's three different types of people. One, the one that's going to tattletale on you the second you turn around. Whether they are doing it because they're mean or they're doing it to save you is honestly sometimes it just felt like because they were mean. Also, there were the ones that um, would tattle, turn around and tattletale on you really quick or like keep it for themselves to tattletale on you when they're in trouble. My half brothers did this a lot. They would get in trouble by my dad and then they would be like, Man is running away with boys! Better go get her! It would deflect from their, them like getting a spanking or whatever. So there's that. The, the friend that's going to turn around and tattletale on you right away. There's this, the second fr friend that's not going to tell on you because they want to be your friend but they're going to really encourage you to tell on yourself or to stop doing what you're doing for the sake of your salvation. Then there's a third one which is my personal favorite. The friends that didn't even give a fuck. <laughs> the ones that are pretty much not even in the order anyways. They don't even want to be there but they're only there because their family's there. Those ones were my favorite ones. <laughs> but that's how it is in The Handmaid's Tale. It's like, are they watching me? Are they an eye? Are they going to tell on me? Because in, in there it's like... It's almost like a brownie point system. Like if you're a good good listener and a good good girl, then you'll get the brownies that they give you. I have a story, sorry, one more story along the lines of that. Daniel specifically had like spies in his family who would spy and then report back to him. And Rachel, my sister, actually told me a story of where Hi, this particular story of Rachel, I just called her to clarify everything. So I'm scrapping the old story. I'm telling you the story f like fresh as it's fresh on my brain from Rachel telling me. So my younger sister Rachel was going to Slick, Salt Lake Community College. I think she was 15, 16 at the time. And she was studying outside of a classroom at this table with a group of boys, outside boys. So as she's studying with them, she looks up and realizes that Daniel's daughter is watching her, intense, intensely watching her, and she's on the phone. Like, mwah, 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 mwah. all of a sudden, Rachel gets a phone call from my dad. He's like, what are you doing? She's like, uh, I'm just studying with my pals, <laughs> with my classmates. She walks away, later on finds out that Daniel's daughter had called and tattletailed and she went over to these outside boys and said, what are you doing with Rachel? You should know she's betrothed. She's engaged to someone else, so you need to back off. That's a real story. <laughs> I do want to briefly mention too, because in this whole episode I talk about how hard it is to be a woman in the order. I have to mention this part. Um, a lot of people were devoted order members and they thought that the order really was the best place on earth because one, they never seen anything else and that's all they know and that's all they heard of so they're like, oh this is the greatest place on earth so they're trying to be so devoted and they're so grateful and then there's another group of people. I knew some people that had left and did have a bad experience because they didn't know anyone on the outside so they're living in their car and they have a really crappy experience so they go back and they're so grateful to be in the order and I want to roll this clip of a handmaid actually kind of being glad she's a handmaid and it really signifies a lot of those order members who enjoy being an order member I'm not gonna let you mess this up for me I'm clean now I got a safe place to sleep every night and I have people who are nice to me yeah they're nice. Probably some of my favorite scenes actually are them shopping in the store because it reminds me so much of the order store. I actually really liked working for it. It's called John's Marketplace. I worked there when I was 15 as a cashier. It was ran by order members and we were taught in the order all of your incomings and outgoings need to be in the name of the Lord which means when you're spending your money it should be an order business. So when we were buying groceries we were encouraged to buy groceries at John's Marketplace. So when I worked there it was like all order people. It was it was a lot like the Handmaid's Tale grocery stores. A bunch of people that, that like 
probably like one person a day was an outsider that would come in there. <laughs> it was mostly order people. And the sad thing, it's very similar, again, the women are always doing the shopping. Where are the men? Busy doing men things, sitting on their throne at home. I don't know. But yeah, it was always women shopping with their buttload of kids and sadly they would, I would hear babies crying in their cars. They would leave their babies in their cars and it was really sad. But yeah, in The Handmaid's Tale too, it's like a woman's job to go grocery shopping. That's not a man's job. And obviously the entire duration of A Handmaid's Life in The Handmaid's Tale, <laughs> for those of you who don't know, the show The Handmaid's Tale, what a handmaid's job is. So in the show, it's basically like there's this plague that not a lot of, like the fertility is going down. So not a lot of women can have kids. So they're taking these women that have the, the gift to have a kid and they're forcing them to have kids. They're like assigning them to different um, families. And <laughs> so similar to the order. The gist of the life of a handmaid though is a lot like an order woman as far as like the most important thing to keep you sane is to suppress your true thoughts and feelings. To keep you safe and sane in that environment you have to suppress your thoughts and feelings because that's the only way to survive in that environment. So you're, you're surrounded by people who, who are taught not to question. We're all taught not to question, even though it feels so wrong. We're taught, don't you dare question, that's, that's a sin because you're questioning God. And then you're sitting there like, not trusting your own intuition. So your whole life, you're being raised to not trust your own intuition because what, each time that that intuition comes out, they hurry and smack it back down and say that you're sinning. So then you feel guilty every time your intuition is coming out. It makes it hard to trust yourself and then you have a bad relationship with yourself. I will mention this happened in The Order and in The Handmaid's Tale and I think in the FLDS. Yeah, it did happen in the FL FLDS too, where they make an example out of the sinners. Like in The Handmaid's Tale, it's extreme, right? They're hanging the bodies and showing like this was a doctor who, who committed abortions. This was a, you know, making sure people know that if they do those things, they're going to suffer the consequences. And then they even did stonings to show like this is what's going to happen to you if you, if you go out of line. I remember a specific story of a boy who left the order and he ended up on drugs. And that was a story that they used in a lot of like Sunday school and like even just at home and have family home evenings. They would make an example out of this guy because he left and he did end up on drugs. So then they would, they would say this is what's going to happen to you if you ever leave. And they would scare us with those things. In the FLDS, I call it banishing, but it was, they call it sent away. They sent people away that were sinning to go repent, right? And that's, that's a form of, you know, making an example out of someone that's not doing what they want. So it scares people into line. Remember my video on brainwashing? How to control someone? The best and easiest and quickest way to control someone is with fear. So if you're living your life in fear, you are not in control of your life. I wanted to briefly mention the whole gay thing because of course this is that they don't like gays in, in the Handmaid's Tale because they're super religious, blah blah blah. In the order, they had something called conversion therapy where married men who had children were going to conversion therapy to try to cure this sickness like being gay is a sickness but in The Handmaid's Tale, they just killed them. But if there were a handmaid who could bring babies into the earth, they would still make them, you know, they would have them be alive, but force them to have babies. But there was a scene where two lesbians were caught loving each other, and one was a Martha, and one was a handmaid. The handmaid is from Gilmore Girls, I actually love her. But because this one was a handmaid and could still bear children, they weren't gonna kill her, but the Martha couldn't bear children, so they killed her. It's kind of like in the order when they kick men out too. So they'll kick men out before they'll kick women out because women, even though they talk bad about women and they, and they like push women down so much and they sex, sexually shame them and they ridicule them, they will not kick them out like they kick men out because they are more important to grow the kingdom of God. Isn't that ironic? The women are so valuable, but they treat them so bad so that the women don't think that they deserve better. It's like such a twisted, like if the women only knew how much power they really had in building that kingdom of God, how much power they have, they're the ones with the power and the men, it's like the men know that so they don't want the women to know that. And of course they're 
uh, and The Handmaid's Tale, they're anti-birth control. In the order, anti-birth control as well. I remember having a conversation with one of my half-brothers. I, I was jokingly like gonna buy my sister condoms for her bachelorette party when she was getting married and he was like, why would you want to do that? Like, I want to poke holes in all of them so that when she accidentally gets pregnant, I can say, you're here because of me. Like, like it's like the savior, savior, like God complex type of, type of thing to like make, sh make sure that a woman's being forced to get pregnant. And it's it twisted into this way of like um, a gift rather than like, you know, a lot of women don't even want kids. And when, they ha when they're forced to have those kids, they're not very good mothers. And then they're putting trauma on these children and these children don't have good lives. Like what's worse, wearing a condom and not having a kid or never doing birth control and having a butt load of kids and they all have trauma and they're all basically gonna have to do a lot of therapy to ever become normal again. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> I have a note that says to look at minute 18 and I don't really know what minute that is. So we're gonna go watch it really quick. He left you intact for a biblical purpose. Like Bina served Rachel. You girls will serve the leaders of the faithful and their barren wives. You will bear children for them. Oh, you are so lucky. So privileged. There's this classroom where they got all the girls to try to, to try to tell them, you know, their purpose now is to have babies because they're all chosen from God, whatever. And Aunt Lydia, the teacher, is like saying, you guys are so lucky. Obviously, how is that something that's lucky? Someone being forced to have babies with a man that they don't want to be sleeping with for God, whatever. In the order, that's how they spun it too. Like, we are so lucky to be in Heavenly Father's kingdom, the kingdom of God on the earth. And we're so lucky to have Brother Paul as the watch, the man on the watchtower. And then they would have these mantras, right? Where it's like, my, it is my firm resolve and fixed purpose to give my all to the Lord, my time, my talents, and all that I am or ever expected to be to the establishment of the building up of the kingdom of God upon the earth. True happiness is not found doing what you want to do, but learning to like to do the things you ought to do. It was a mantra that we would say every day, and it was like brainwashing us to believe that we were in the, the greatest place on earth, right? People, they would tell us that in the ends of times, people would be begging begging to be a part of the order because it's it's just shines like no other. I remember thinking, I do not feel lucky to be here. I feel like th I've been plagued with a, a duty. <laughs> I've been plagued with a job that God has asked of me that I wouldn't even ask my, I wouldn't even wish upon my worst enemy, but God is asking me to do this. And I kept thinking like Satan, the devil, whatever you want to call him, he seems nicer than God. And what are the men having to do? These righteous numbered men, they don't have to do any of that. <laughs> they get us bowing down to them and giving them the best seat in the house. Yes, we are so lucky to be in the kingdom of God upon the earth. You know, the only ones that are lucky are Paul and his brothers because they get all the money, they get all the biatches, and they get to do whatever the hell they want. I don't even think they believe in God. <laughs> they think that they're God. thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out. And that also is in the same verses as if the right hand offend thee, cut it off. And they would use that verse in the order to talk about if your family leaves the order, cut them off. I don't know how that correlates. <laughs> but basically cut off anyone who is going to make you question brother Paul. It's interesting that God gives us a brain, but then Paul tells us not to use it and that he will, he will tell us what to do. It's interesting, isn't it? This part is like so hard for me to watch. It's it's like they're basically like blaming this woman, this poor woman for some tragic thing that happened to her and they're telling her that it was her fault. The voice just kept coming down into the basement. Hours felt like whose fault was it? Whose fault was it, girls? Her fault. 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 Why, why would God let something like this happen to this girl? First of all, they're saying it's her fault, and the second reason is to teach her a lesson. And that's something that was big in the order. I remember, I don't know if it's super big now, but there was a time where they would teach, like, if, if your life is having all these bad things happening, if you're having bad stuff happen, it's your fault. You need to 
figure out what you're doing wrong. And I remember a woman telling me this story. She had like eight kids at the time. The woman of eight kids is like holding one baby in this arm, laying in like a car seat and then holding another baby in this arm. And she's trying to walk into church and she was wearing heels and she falls. And this is right after Paul gave, I think it was Paul. I can't remember who she said gave this talk, but someone gave a talk saying that whole, whole spiel about how if bad things are happening to you, it's because of you. So she falls with these babies and she's on the ground and people were walking by her and not helping her because that mindset was put into them. This is your fault. You're doing something. Hmm? Sucks to be you. Can you imagine that mindset? Like you're just surrounded by people who aren't going to help you because you deserve it. Okay, this is the grossest scene of them all in the very first episode. But basically, Mr. Waterford comes in and he grabs the Bible and he shares a verse. And this is a verse that order people love to use. Order people's favorite verse is D&C 132. But it's very similar to this verse that Mr. Waterford starts talking about. Well, let's get started. And when Rachel saw that she bared Jacob no children, Rachel envied her sister and said unto Jacob, give me children or else I die. The ceremony is when he impregnates the handmaid because the handmaid's supposed to bring forth their child, right? So the ceremony, he brings out this Bible and he shows this verse to try to justify what he's doing. And that's what they do in the order. They bring out this Bible verse to justify what they're doing to these women. How... Oh, a lot of these cults kind of act like, you know, sex is for God. <laughs> it's such a weird thing to say, but like, you don't pleasure yourself. You do that stuff to have a child. Um, and that's why you wait till marriage and blah, blah, blah. And I remember my mom telling me when I first got married, she was like, sex isn't that great, is it? And I was like, well, it's probably not great for you because he sleeps with your sister and his sister, and I'm sure he's selfish in bed because his whole life he's been put on a pedestal. So it's all about me, 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 me. He's a narcissist in the making when he's five years old. So maybe sex isn't that great for like most of the women in the order because there's a lot of selfish men. But also, you know, sex is supposed to be to get the woman pregnant. And again, like we've told the story about Michelle's mom, how Michelle's mom was like, why would you ever have sex if you're pregnant? because she didn't understand the concept of sex being something pleasurable. It's just to procreate and make babies. I even heard, I don't know how true this is, but I heard, I should ask my FLDS friend, but that in the FLDS, there was a time period where they could not get naked to have sex. They only had like, their like garment had like a little flap and that, that's, that's how they did it. We have this scene on The Handmaid's Tale where they are stoning a rapist, right? And it's like, oh my gosh, so shocking that this man could be a rapist. And yes, he raped and, and like the, the woman was pregnant, so killed the baby in the show. So they're like all mortified, but it's like, even if he was just a rapist, they would stone him, right? Because that's such a sin, but these men are raping the handmaids. It's so crazy how in the order it's the same. Like they talk about how there's rapists in the outside world, right? And like the outside world's so ugly and you can't trust anyone out there. They're all like raping and blah, blah, blah. These men in the order are doing the same thing. Marital rape isn't even a, th like there's no such thing as your husband raping you, okay? I mean, at least it wasn't a thing when I was there. I just remember women talking like, I can't wait till my husband gets remarried so he can get off of me. Like they had, their body wasn't theirs. And rape was covered up a lot, especially if it was in Paul's family. When I say Paul's family, I mean the seven brothers. It's just very contradicting that they could scold rapists, yet they are, are rapists. It's, it's so shocking to me. And it's also like, Again, one another thing that, that's so contradicting is the whole uh, adultery is against the Ten Commandments, yet they're doing it every day. You know what I'm saying? It's like, where is the, why don't, why are we even reading the Bible? <laughs> Make your own at this point. So ironic, right? Thou shalt not commit adultery, they're committing adultery. Shaming rapists and they're raping. In The Handmaid's Tale, they're like all about the Bible, right? And it literally the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not kill. And here they are stoning people and hanging people. It's like, wow. You need a basket for all those cherries you're picking? Cherry picking. A cherry picking. <laughs> Just kidding. Shh.
shit. Birthing, right? It's such a big deal in The Handmaid's Tale. They have like this big gathering and everyone's there for the birthing and it's like a big ordeal and they're like congratulating and like they're high-fiving this handmaid that got pregnant like she did it because that is the only purpose. That is her only purpose. The difference though with The Handmaid's Tale and with The Order is in The Handmaid's Tale it was like all women and the women were delivering the baby from when I was a kid, men. Numbered men were, were delivering the baby. Yeah, there was a time where my little brothers had the cord wrapped around, wrapped around his neck when he was born and he was blue in the face and my dad had to like give him CPR. There were midwives, like one <laughs> that I knew of when I was there, but one midwife to all the women having kids, no. It was usually a numbered man or the dad. Well, the dad is a numbered man. I've heard a lot of ex-order members say this, when they smell the smell of brown, there's a brown Lysol bottle. It reminds you of birth, childbirth because that's what they use to clean things up. I don't know why they use that specific brown Lysol bottle, but that's what it always smelled like after someone had a baby. That's how you knew someone had a baby, <laughs> was the brown Lysol. Or the bucket of the placenta in the bathroom. Is that gross? I remember seeing my first placenta in a bucket, well, knowing what it was, at 12. I think I was 12. I helped bury it in the yard. And then my dog dug it up and tried to eat it. <laughs> Anyway, you know what's crazy? I just learned this. Obviously, women were always blamed if, if they couldn't get pregnant, and that's apparent in The Handmaid's Tale, too. It's like the woman is broken. They're, they never question the man, but in the order, if they were having fertility problems, there were times where it was the man's fault. So the man would do a 40-day fast, and for some reason, that would help the sperm count. You should do your research on this, Liz. I just learned this. The 40-day fast, it's like when your body's dying, it tries to regenerate everything and including sperm count. Isn't that weird? Look it up. Look it up because I don't want to. <laughs> you can. There's this scene. It just makes me grossed out. But Mr. Waterford like pairs off with the handmaid and you're not supposed to be doing that. Obviously, it's like a form of cheating. It's a lot like the order in that aspect where you would see men doing things like this or they would say, it's none of my wife's business who I'm going forward on. I would walk into married men pairing off with like my half sisters and it's just like, the men don't really get scolded for doing that, but a woman will. Like if a woman is married and she's pairing off with a guy, who's gonna get scolded? She is. Never did I see a man really get scolded for it. And this, the, I'll take it a step further. If you watch my sister's story, Cammy was basically forced to go on to these dates with married men, and some of them their wives didn't even know. So Cammy was forced to participate basically in adultery. <laughs> I don't know, I, I'm laughing because it's like, it's like so twisted, and yet they can slap the label of the Bible on that in so somehow. What? The, these cults don't hold men accountable. I think the world doesn't hold men accountable. So us women need to rise up and hold them accountable because they ain't gonna do it. Sorry for the like four men watching this. I, maybe you're not like that. <laughs> you guys have a track record. You do. Okay, I remember having this fight with my dad and he was like, he was trying to, he was trying to like justify his racism. And he's like, Amanda, it is a fact. It is a fact that there are more black people, there are more black people than white people in prison. It's just a fact. And then I turned around and I was like, well, it's also a fact that there's more men that go to prison than women. So there you go. It's men, it's not the color, it's the men. Also, you owe child support. <laughs> you should be in prison. The sad thing too is I remember Jessica talking about how she felt safe with this 40 something year old guy while she's a little teenager it felt safer than her home so a lot of women will be like i would rather go marry this old ass dude than be under my parents anymore because either their parents are abusive their parents are you know working them to the bone or they just can't they can't handle living in their parents house anymore that they're willing to go be with the guy that the parents want them to be with sometimes i think that the parents do it on purpose the parents make the kids have a living hell so that it's more enticing for them to marry this old ass dude over here because he seems nicer it's really sad it's like one hell to a neck not so bad hell but i think that 
again, to correlate with The Handmaid's Tale, when they're acting out with this family, they get taken away and they just put them into another family. Like, it's like, there's no end to the hell. <laughs> In the show, there's this whole scene about how, like, women can't own property anymore, women can't have access to their bank accounts, they have to have a man be in charge of it, and in the order, we have we have this banking system where I think I've explained this before, right? Where it's a, a green card, yellow card, blue card. Even if you're an adult, you have to call what they call the card line, and you had to ask if you can get an add-on to get money into your account. And they could just say no. You could literally have like thousands upon thousands of dollars in there, and they could just say no. And that happened a lot. <laughs> and there were times where if you were rebellious acting out or leaving, then they would act like you didn't have any money in your account and they would say that they would literally call you and say you owed them money. And I really feel like that was a, a tactic to see how loyal you were because the loyal ones would be like, oh my gosh, I owe you money? Okay, let me hurry and do that. And then the ones like me, well, they never even called me. They knew that they weren't gonna get shit out of me, but they called my sister and she was like, no, I don't owe you money. And they're like, Okay, bye. Click. You were not encouraged to have an outside bank account. And you know why? Well, this is what I believe. You have more freedom when you have that. They don't have control of your money. And same with The Handmaid's Tale. They don't want the women to have control. They don't want the women to have any power because then they have the power over them. They don't want them to be free. They want them to serve them. I just want to briefly show this scene of where June, it's June before she becomes Alfred, she gets fired from her job and the guy's like, I, I had no choice, I had to fire all the women and it's bull, it's bullshit, but she gets fired and I want to mention briefly, my mom, I say this a lot but I'm going to bring it up again, my mom got fired, well she got demoted in her position at her job, she actually had a really good paying job before me, Cammy and Rachel started to lead the order she had a good paying job and then as soon as her, 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 basically her worth, right, her daughters of, you know, because they trade. Daughters are valuable and if you have these daughters, you get opportunities. You all of a sudden get all these things handed to you because they want your daughters. So my mom had a good paying job, she had a nice house, then her daughters start to leave and they don't submit to the disgusting men that they wanted us to submit to. So all of a sudden my mom gets demoted to a janitor position, gets pushed out of her new house back into her old house. And she's like, why is this happening? Gets a position for $7.25 an hour. She has 10 kids and they did that to her. And that's how it is. I actually don't know how that correlates with the firing women. I just really wanted to bring that part up. <laughs> Anywho, in The Handmaid's Tale, you know, they're obviously expected to get pregnant and try their best to get pregnant, just like in The Order. A, a woman, as soon as she's married, needs to get pregnant. Like, why are you pregnant right now? Like, your wedding night, why aren't you pregnant? The difference, though, is in The Handmaid's Tale, then the pregnant ones are like, they get special treatment, they don't get beat, blah, blah, blah. And it's like a, a, a kind of like, they, they it makes them want to be pregnant more because they want to be treated like that. In The Order, though, the women who get pregnant are still expected to work full time and pay for their kids and take the kids to school and be a mother and pay, make the meals and without a husband and then do it again the next year. <laughs> they do get the praise though. They do get a lot of praise for having kids. They get also scolded for not having them. I feel so bad for these order women. And then I remember like, If I was still in the order right now, I'm 27 years old, I would have, if I married the guy that I was supposed to marry at the time that I was supposed to marry him, I would have like, if I had babies as much as, I, as my mom did, like as fast, you know, I would have like seven, eight, nine kids right now. You guys definitely wouldn't be seeing my face. <laughs> the whole, I'm the favorite, he loves me more, blah, blah, blah. That was a game that a lot of men in the order liked to play. They would like to pick favorites and they would tell a wife, oh, you're my favorite. And then they would go turn around and tell the other wife, oh, you're my favorite. And I think some of them like to see, like, fighting. And then others like to see how much the woman would do for them if they were the favorite. And like to keep that status of the favorite. Like, it's just so stupid. But I think in The Handmaid's Tale, he told her that she was his favorite just to kind of like manipulate her and get her to do what he wanted because at the end of the day, it's not like he like tells her that he's gonna run away with her. It's not like he was going to, you know what I mean? 
So if you go to minute 31 in this same episode, they say, Blessed are those who suffer for the cause, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And that's very similar to what we were saying every day in the Memory Gems. True happiness is not found doing what you want to do, but learning to like to do the things you ought to do. It's kind of the similar thing where it's going to be hard on this earth and you just have to do it and then you will get the blessings in heaven, right? So you have to fulfill your duty on this earth to get reap the rewards in heaven. Blessed are those who suffer for the cause, for there is, theirs is the kingdom of God. And that also ties into what my mom used to tell me, how she's going to get all these blessings in heaven for sacrificing and going through so much in the kingdom of God upon the earth to get to heaven, right? It's this mind F that we have because it is hard. It's not easy. And so we have to keep telling ourselves in this cult that there is a greater purpose on the other side if we just endure it for the rest of our lives. That is a very important part in the show that resonates with the order. So someone escapes and they make it to freedom and they do not try to go hunt them down and kill them. They just try to discredit them, right? Make them seem like they're not successful or great or happy or living a good life, right? And that's something that they do in the order. For me, I am someone who has left the order, who has been out for almost nine years and I'm speaking out against them. To get the, the followers, to get the followers of the order to not believe me is to discredit me, to talk bad about me, to shame me, to ridicule me, and to talk about how I'm going straight to hell, right? To make it seem like I am not happy out here, I am not, oh, she wishes so bad she could come back, she just can't, you know, all the, all, all the rumors that are said about me. Discredit, 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 so that people are afraid to trust me. And it works, it does work. I've had a lot of people message me and they won't tell me who they are because they're afraid of me. And they say that. They even say like, please don't tell on me, please don't tell on me. Like they, there's this distrust with me, 100%, so much distrust with me and even people hating me because there's so much said about me. <laughs> Which honestly, I take it as a compliment. Like. They must be having a lot of talks about me because they're afraid of how much I can say that will impact the minds of these brainwashed kids. So they have to discredit me because that's all they can do. There's a really gross scene on The Handmaid's Tale where uh, Offred goes to the doctors to do a checkup and the doctor offers her his sperm because he knows that Mr. Waterford is is basically infertile like he's like he, you're never gonna get pregnant and they're gonna blame you so I can help you by impregnating you and this reminds me of there was a story going around the order that there was a man who's infertile and he's he's within the hierarchy like he's related really closely with Paul and his brothers and they didn't want him to have this reputation of being infertile so he went into the orders clinic and she went into the orders clinic and they didn't know that also his brother, who's fertile, went into the clinic. And she thought that she was being given the sperm of her husband, but it was actually her husband's brother. I heard this story a while back and I even talked to someone in the order about it and they were furious that that was happening. But see, this is just one of the stories that we know of. How many stories do we not know of, you know what I mean? Having children is so important to them that even when David Kingston went to prison for raping his niece, somehow his wives were still getting pregnant. How? What, what do you think? I do want to mention this story briefly since we're talking about the fertility of men being a woman's issue. Uh, they usually do blame the woman. Like, Every time I've seen it actually, when there's having a hard time getting pregnant, it's, it's a woman. The, they look at the woman first. And I personally know someone who 
they told her basically that because they found out that it was the husband's fault that she couldn't get pregnant and they were like well we're going to tell everyone it's your fault because then my sons are going to have a harder time getting married like the the father was saying he doesn't want it to be known amongst the order that his kids can't impregnate the wives because then they're gonna have a hard time getting married so he blamed and shamed the wife even though he knew that it was his son's incapability of getting her pregnant. They do IVF in the order too if they can't get pregnant because it's like so important to have kids. Minute 50 of episode 4 uh, being happy for small victories because so much is taken. It's interesting how you really have to celebrate those little moments when you're when your life is being so controlled. I feel like it's similar to being in prison where something as little as like the lunch menu <laughs> could make your day because you don't have any say of what's happening in your life. So you have to celebrate those little tiny victories because otherwise you just want to die. <laughs> I remember crying when I first saw this part because I was physically, mentally, emotionally feeling this at the moment when I very first saw this. So the scene is Moira finally makes it out and she's free, she survived, she's in Canada now and she's at this like survivor center, this refuge center and they're trying to help her and ask her like what she needs and she's like so overwhelmed with now that she's free and I remember going through that after leaving. It's like there's so much freedom that it's scary. Like you go from being so confined and every decision is made for you every day to now you have to make every single decision of your entire life. It all depends on you. And your brain has been wired to not do that for so long that it's overwhelming and people end up going back to the order, my cult, people will leave and end up going back because that overwhelmingness of freedom is too much to bear. They don't know how to cope with making decisions for themselves. I know how weird that sounds, but maybe some of you understand this, maybe some of you that um, had controlling parents at one point or a controlling husband at one point where you, you had to put aside your freedom of choice for so long that once you get it back, it feels uncomfortable. I wanna briefly mention uh, episode five, minute 2738. It's like there's a scene where this wife has compassion for this poor handmaid, like she tries to like resonate with her, but she has no power. And it's it sucks because there's people in the order who want to help so bad, but they have no power they, that they can't help. And they try to be like an emotional support, like that's really all they can be. Because if you have no power, you, if you let them take away your power, you have no power, so you can do nothing. Same with the code size for minute 4410. There's a quote, they say, it's going to be okay, we're gonna look out for each other. And in this scene, you can see her face, she's like so discouraged by that type of encouragement. And it's so similar in the order. It's like someone who has absolutely no power, who can do absolutely nothing, trying to encourage you like, it's okay, I'll take care of you. Well, we got each other's back. It's like, you have no power. They have your money. They have, you are brainwashed too. How are you gonna help me? You can't even help yourself. It's like the blind leading the blind. You know, like, I'll get us out of here. And it's like, you're blind too though. <laughs> We're all brainwashed, how are we supposed to get out of here? It's nighttime now, I've been filming all day and I told myself, I told myself I can't leave my room until I'm done with this video. <laughs> so, we are powering through. It was day and now it is night. So, we are, <laughs> we're still going. Um, where were we? The handmaid, Offred, has the opportunity to, okay, let me explain the scene. Let me set the scene, let me set the mood. So, 
the commanders and, and everyone is trying to like barter with other countries so they have these like presidents from other countries coming in to see how they're operating because america supposedly has the best birth rate like their 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 economy is doing really well because they're forcing people to have kids and they're doing things you know that are so wrong but they're coming over to america to see like if they can trade things for handmaids or for kids, which is really messed up. And also to like observe how their economy is doing so well. So the, these people from outside of Gilead come in and have a meeting and they meet Offred and they, there's this scene where they ask Offred, I would like to know more about your sacred position. Did you choose to be a handmaid? Yes, you have chosen such a difficult life. Are you happy? And it's a very impactful, powerful scene. And this part gave me like flashbacks to when I was in the order. There were moments where I had an opportunity to tell outsiders all about the order and I chose to lie out of fear and also out of that obligation to protect the kingdom of God. There's multiple reasons why we lie to outsiders. We're ingrained to lie to outsiders. And then there's a scene where she beats herself up like, I, I lied, I, I told them I was happy. She's upset at herself for lying like that. And I went through that same thing too. And then she goes back and she tells the truth and they do nothing. Same thing happened to me. I told police, and I have friends who had the opportunity to tell police officers what was going on and the type of abuse that was happening to them, and they were sent back home and nothing happened. And I think that it's a Utah problem. Utah is more like willing to put kids back into the home of the family. They're very like family state, which I think is also why the suicide rate is so high in Utah. Oh, I did want to correlate or, or like relate the whole trading women thing. If you guys remember earlier in this episode, I talked about how when my mom had no women of age to be married left because we all left the order, then all of a sudden her status goes down. She gets demoted to a janitor position, loses her house. That's something that's like a commodity here. And I want to mention too, so there's this family, and I've said this multiple times on my channel actually, I refer to this family they have a whole lane named after them okay they own a lot of the pawn shops they're very rich for order standards and something that you will notice is every single one of the daughters in the family married paul's sons every single daughter married into that family and you see they have, they're, they're building homes on this lane with all of the families and they own the pawn shops and they're very wealthy. And you have to wonder, is it because they give their daughters to Paul? Probably. In episode seven, there's this scene where June's lover, I don't know if they're married or boyfriend or whatever, but it's the, her baby daddy. He's like fighting to go back to find June, to be with her and to save her. And they grab him and they tell him that if he goes back, he's going to die. If you go back, you will die. And I like to relate this to order members where a lot of us want to go back and help our family. And, and we want to stay to help our family. But the reality is if you stay and you are in that environment, you can't help them. You can't help them. You have to leave get the resources and then come back. Like you can't physically help someone if you can't help yourself. And so in that scene, it's like, of course you want so badly to, to stay and to help them, but you don't have the resources to do that. So you have to be smart about it and you have to leave and go get those resources and then you can come back later. A lot of older people do say I'm staying. I've heard people say this to me actually, cause I've, I would hear stories about certain people that are getting, um, shamed and ridicule, ridiculed in the order, so I'll reach out to them and be like, hey, are you okay? Do you need help? And they'll say things like, yes, I'm fine. I don't believe in the group, but I need to stay here to help the group from within, to help 
the corruption from inside. And I always feel bad for people who think like that because, again, it's like someone at the bottom of the chain trying to have the control that the leader has. And it's, it's hard because you're also risking your own mental state by staying. You can help, in my opinion, you can help more when you get out and you get out of the brainwashing and you can finally heal yourself and then you can help heal others. Again, of the blind leading the blind type of situation. You're still being brainwashed whether you think you are or not. And I, I, I'm not speaking from someone who thought that I had a strong brain when I was in the order. I was still being manipulated and used to their advantage. I feel like this is how the meetings with Paul and his brothers look. So there's a scene where Mr. Waterford's having like a meeting with these other higher up men and they're talking about how if they don't have the women on their side, they'll never be successful. But the women aren't gonna go for this whole handmade idea. The human race is at risk. What is important is efficiency. So what do you propose? <sighs> it's not rocket science. All remaining fertile women should be collected and impregnated by those of superior status, of course. Talking about concubines. I don't care what you want to call it. The wives would never accept it. Well, that's a non-issue. No, we won't succeed without their support, you know that. Maybe the wife should be there for the act. It would be less of a violation. There is scriptural precedent. Act may not be the best name. From a branding perspective. The ceremony? Sounds good, nice and godly. The wives would eat that shit up. And it's so gross the way they're talking, but I really feel like it's similar to how the numbered men talk in their meetings. It's really sad too how the women do get very manipulated by the men and it, the women turn out to be the manipulators as well. So not only do we have these men of power manipulating, but then the women become manipulators too. Okay, so I have a few more notes with like season two. And obviously we only we only really got through season one so if you guys are interested in hearing more about like the the deeper in-depth brainwashing with season two three four and five if you guys like this video let me know in the comments down below and maybe we'll do a part two series but that is all the notes that I had <laughs> this took me like months to prepare so I hope you guys like it and I hope to see you guys on the next episode of Cultic Cup of Coffee Thank you for watching and I'll see you next Sunday.